Hi, my name's Sam. I'm curate here at St John's. We've just finished our Friday morning top session, uh, which we have every week here in the church hall, and it's been really, really fun. Coming up uh, this week, we're going into Holy Week as we draw up to Easter. Uh, so this coming Sunday is Palm Sunday, where we remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, and uh, then we move into Holy Week. So each day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, We've got uh, Eucharist in the church at 11 a.m. Do come and join us for that if you'd like. Then later on Thursday, we've got the Agape meal, which will just be fantastic in the evening. Just for a little bit of money, you can come and uh, share a meal together. We'll be talking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prepared to die. And there'll be foot washing, and there'll be um, uh, communion there as well. Uh, and then we move into Good Friday. Uh, so first thing on uh, Friday at 9.30, there'll be a family's breakfast here in the church hall uh, with some fun and games. And then we'll go down to the Unity service, which will be in Queen's Square. So come join us in Queen's Square at 11 a.m. service on that day uh, as we worship Jesus in the midst of the town. Uh, and then uh, we move into Easter, oh, <laughs> so we'll be there in Queen Square, worshipping Jesus together in the midst of the town with uh, loads of other churches joining us as well. Uh, and then uh, we, in the St John's we'll come back and do meditations at the cross from 12 until 3pm. Come and join us for a quiet and reflective time considering what Jesus went through. Uh, and then there will be uh, nothing on the Saturday going into Easter Sunday. Resurrection Day, where we remember Jesus rising from the dead, and we celebrate that with uh, about 15 baptisms at the 11 o'clock and the 6 o'clock services on Sunday. And obviously, we've got a really special 9 a.m. service as well. So, do join us for any or all of those things that are happening over Holy Week and the Easter season. Look forward to seeing you there. Uh, to Liz and Reninkas as well. Great to have you here at St. John's. So I want to start with a question this morning, which is um, this. Would you describe yourself as someone who is holy? Not just in terms of your standing before God, but the way that you live. Would you describe yourself as holy? Would you say that someone who comes and visits St. John's would go away describing this church as holy and having experienced the holiness of God being here? In preparing for this series that we're in at the moment, um, Pursuing Holiness, I've been asking others, who do you know who is holy and what sets them apart as being holy? And the answers have been interesting. Most people have racked their brains for a while and could only think of a few people over the years that they said they knew personally who they would describe as holy. And the qualities that they associated with these people were things like joy in the face of great trial, peace in the face of testing, consistent love to all sorts of people, prayerfulness, a passion for Jesus, and courage in the face of opposition. But the Bible is clear that holiness is not just an option for a few special people that we might have known over the years. The call is for all of us to be a people who are holy. 1 Peter 1 15, which should come up on the screen. I'm reading, by the way, from the NIV, UK version, but I think here, this is the ESV, uh, which should come up. 1 Peter 1.15 says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Let me read it again. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. In all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. So what is holiness? If God says we are to be holy, like him, what does that look like? 
When I first became a Christian many, many years ago, way back in the 1970s, not the 1870s, um, I used to think that it meant don't smoke, um, or if you did smoke, make sure it wasn't kind of too damaging. Uh, don't swear, don't shop on Sundays, um, don't listen to Led Zeppelin or The Who, my favorite bands. And uh, I emptied out a lot of my very precious record collection around that time uh, as a result. Now, I now know that holiness is not a list of external do's and don'ts. Rather, holiness must break into every part of my being, my motives, my thoughts, my attitudes, my priorities, my lifestyle, my relationship. It invades every part. It's what I do when no one's looking and what I do when everybody's looking and a consistency between the two. And this series, Pursuing Holiness, has been one of the toughest ones I think in my entire life I've ever had to prepare for. I've wrestled, I've been up sometimes through the night thinking about this, praying into this, um, coming to this morning feeling incredibly inadequate. I was away this week on holiday and just found myself praying night after night, God, just in your mercy, please, please help me and please help us as a people. Why is it tough? Because I know that when I look at God's holiness, my own lack of holiness is exposed. My unholiness comes into his light. And I know for myself, I'm still daily trying to nail unholy traits to the cross. And secondly, I think it's difficult because if God in his grace allows me and allows us to see and experience his holiness, like Isaiah says in Isaiah 6, I will be undone and I think we will all be undone. I think this series, Pursuing Holiness, could be the most disruptive truth we will ever meditate upon as a church and come into. But I believe that if we come with open hearts, for all of us, it will be profoundly challenging. It will be uncomfortable. It will be costly for us as a church. If this is going to go beyond just teaching and uh, sort of a theological, a deeper theological understanding, I think our whole depth of our being is going to be challenged as we personally experience God. We will not remain the same. We will be undone. Some people I know may even want to leave because it can become an uncomfortable thing and um, because... Holiness brings us closer to God and our lives are turned upside down. Now, there's three things I want to look at today as we consider experiencing God's holiness, which is our theme for this morning, experiencing God's holiness. The first thing I want us to consider is that God alone is holy. God alone is holy. God defines what holiness is. And holy is the description given of him again and again throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, God is the Holy One of Israel. Lots of references to describing him in that way. In Isaiah 6, verse 3, Isaiah is given a vision of angelic beings around the throne of heaven, proclaiming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. It's what we sung this morning. And it's repeated 800 years later when the Apostle John is given a vision of heaven, which is written about in the book of Revelation. Revelation 4, 8, where the angelic beings are still saying, it says, night and day, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And we presume that that is what they've been doing throughout those uh, 800 years and are still doing so now. So when we give ourselves to worship in this way, and as we were worshiping this morning, and thanks Sarah for just pausing and letting us dwell in that place, we're joining in with what is going on in heaven in that unseen realm. 
Greg Haslam says in his commentary on Isaiah 6, the angels attendant on God's presence sang of his holiness and in an antiphonal manner, calling and responding to one another in rising crescendos of undulating praise. They were repeating their declaration of God's holiness over and over, gladly acknowledging his total rule and his distinct, distinction from all of his creation. Is that what we were caught up with, with this morning in our hearts? He says, God is surrounded by sheer, unadulterated, burning holiness. A holiness so intense that even the seraphim have to hide their faces to shield themselves from him. So this proclamation is the sound that fills the heavenly realm. And that those of us who know him will enter when beyond death we go to be with him and we join this angelic host. And this quality of God's holiness is what absorbed these angelic beings and will completely absorb us for all eternity. Such is the awesome majesty of his holiness that they and we cannot help but proclaim it when we experience it. God's holiness is applicable to every part of his being. God is all that is true, pure, good, righteous, just, faithful, loving, and perfect. And God's whole being includes all his attributes of love and mercy, but also of just, justice justice and judgment. All of these characteristics are fully holy. His judgment and wrath are as holy as his love and his mercy. In the Old Testament, when Moses met with God on Mount Sinai, God made it clear that the people and the priests should not touch the mountain where God has presenced himself with Moses. He, the Bible says they were unconsecrated, and it says he would strike them down if they touched the mountain. It says in Exodus 19, 22 and 24, if you want to read about it, he said he would break out against them if they did. Because of God's presence on this mountain, it was set apart as holy. And God's presence brings God's holiness and God's holiness brings consequences. So when we say, God, we want to know your presence, and we ask for his presence, that will bring consequences to us. In the Old Testament, the most holy place, first in the tabernacle, the tent, and then the temple, was for the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God. So the place where God himself was dwelling was holy. And the high priest, having offered specific sacrifices and being set apart, being consecrated, entered this holy of holies once a year and was thought to have a rope tied round his leg in case his own unholiness led to him being killed by the holiness of God and having to be dragged out. It's echoed in Psalm 24.3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. In the New Testament, God's holiness is seen in the person of Jesus Christ. God incarnate. God incarnates holiness and demonstrates how holiness is expressed he is, as it says in Hebrews 1.3, the exact representation of the Father. He was God's presence on the earth. And his holiness includes his love and mercy extended to the repentant sinner and the one who overturned tables in the temple, driving out people with a whip and calling out the religious leaders for their hypocrisy. So God defines holiness and what holiness is. Second thing I want to 
reflect on this morning is that God's holiness exposes our unholiness. As we consider the holiness of God, we realize that this is not some academic or theological exercise. If we come genuinely with hearts that are open and hungry, our private and public priorities and the inner workings of our heart will be transformed. Having the holiness of God revealed to us by the Spirit exposes our own need and our uncleanness. Let's go back to the passage I mentioned earlier in Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, 1 to 4. Isaiah, who was already this incredible prophet, prophesied to the people of Israel who knew God. He said, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him was seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. What a great prophetic foretelling of what Christ has done on the cross. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. I believe as with Isaiah, we need a vision of the holiness of God. I need, as as Isaiah said, to see the Lord. I think we can end up with a blurred vision of God and our blurred vision of God can give rise often to flippant, casual approaches to our worship and obedience to him. God can end up becoming maybe our therapist, our get-out-of-jail-free card, our chum, our supplier of goods, but not the one who exposes our own ruin and the only one that we look to for our salvation and transformation. You know, we can often ask for his presence, for a bit of comfort or reassurance, perhaps without realizing that his holy presence will shake us to the core and will leave us trembling. So when we pray... Come, Holy Spirit. We need to do so, I believe, with a godly fear, not just, God, I want to be comforted. He does that. Or, God, I need your strength. He does that. But also, just with the realization, the Holy Spirit enables us to see the holiness of God. And that should bring about a godly fear. Wanting to see God in his holiness and experiencing his holy presence will mean we won't be thinking about when the service will end or what we're going to have for Sunday lunch or tea. I believe everything as we see his holiness would be disruptive. Disrupted. We would cry to God for mercy, be sensitized to sin, want to put our marriages right, stop blaming others, would turn off our screens and be on our face in surrender and worship, asking him to send us into the world as Isaiah did. And this long-term effect on Isaiah was to cause him to lead this life of worship, to surrender himself to the service of God, and to engage in mission, in bringing God's word. And worship 
will first and always be the result of our encounter with God's holiness. Without that ongoing revelation of the holiness of God, worship is likely to become just potentially entertainment. You know, we get into the tunes, we get into the rhythms and the phrases, but nothing more. And true worship is no cheap result of encountering God. It's the painful process of dying to self in his holy presence and making him preeminent in his life. So it is what we are caught up with. Greg Haslam again says this. He said, the small and impotent God we have fashioned for ourselves is a God who can never shock or frighten us and who can be easily understood because we have somehow packaged and contained him that he can never surprise us, never overwhelm us, never astonish us, and never disturb or shake us. But that is not the God of the Bible. When we encounter the real God, you will be ruined forever. And any encounter with the Holy God is to make us see right, to live right, and do right, not simply to look or feel good in our own eyes or the eyes of others. It was Oswald Chambers who said, God God does not tell us what he's going to do. He reveals to us who he is. God does not tell us what he's going to do. He reveals to us who he is. When we look back on a church service, the question we should be asking is, did we encounter the holy God and have we been changed? That should be our reflection on any meeting like this of God's people. So I thought back over my life. I thought, have I ever experienced the holiness of God? And I think maybe just on a few occasions, but I'm actually, I'm thirsty and hungry for more as I've wrestled with this and meditated on this and just kind of realize and assess where my life is, as Steve and Liz have just called us, to consider our ways and consider our life. I've tried to say, God, where have I got to in my life? God, I need a new encounter with you. I think one of those encounters was way back in, I was trying to remember when it was, I think it was 1994, when a gathering of pastors at a showground in the Midlands it was at a meeting where Terry Virgo, who uh, for many years led the New Frontiers family of churches, he shared about an outpouring of the Holy Spirit he had experienced in the United States just before he came to that meeting. And as he shared, the Holy Spirit just fell on the meeting. There was no invitation. God just came. Uh, There was about a hundred or so pastors in the room. There were bodies all over the floor. The schedule for the two days went out the window. And people were left groaning in God's presence for all the time that we had uh, planned on being together. Another time was in Pensacola, Florida, Florida, where I was attending a church that was experiencing the presence of God Um, in an unusual way, resulting in thousands turning up to queue every day to get into the meetings. The nightly speaker was a man called Steve Hill, who brought a very simple message of repentance and a charge every night to don't mess with God. Don't mess with God. And night after night, men and women ran to the front and were on their faces doing business with God as they were exposed to God's holiness. And uh, there was a young woman who just sang night after night, come to the mercy seat, come to the mercy seat, and hundreds did. By the end of that week, I felt raw. I felt scrubbed clean. There was nowhere to hide. Excuses and intellectualism went out the window, We were all undone in that group of us from the UK who went, there were six of us. And the call to don't mess with God perhaps doesn't seem to fit well with our British culture, but it is biblical. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. 
It talks, the context is we reap what we sow. I know of a church leader, C.J. Mahaney, who did a series with his church on, fancy doing a series on this, the people that God killed. <laughs> How about doing that, Liz? The people that God killed. It probably doesn't sit comfortably with us, but it's there throughout Scripture. Often it was because people had tried to approach or respond to God without due consideration of his holiness. Offering unauthorized fire in Leviticus 10, touching the Ark of the Covenant to Samuel 6, and even looking at it, 1 Samuel 6. Then there's the shocking story in the New Testament of Ananias and Sapphira, who were struck down for lying to the Holy Spirit and the apostles about the extent of their offering. And the Christians in Corinth who became sick and even died because of taking the Lord's Supper, it says, in an unworthy manner. So as we pursue holiness, we have to be mindful of the consequences of his holy presence. And thirdly, the thing I want us to think about is God's holiness can be seen by all. What about those who are not Christians? What about those who don't get to perhaps read the Bible much, come to church? Has God hidden himself and his holiness from them? Do they have an excuse? The Bible says that God is constantly speaking about himself. Psalm 19 says this in 1 to 2. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. And as we've already read about in Isaiah 6, the whole earth is full of your glory. You know, it astonishes me the faith that atheists display. Intelligent people discuss the marvels and complexities of the human body, the wonders of the cosmos, the sea, the sun, the trees, spectacular diversity, meticulous design at an atomic and molecular level and right up to the beauty of galaxies. But then they resort to the most illogical and unscientific explanation. They just say, well... There was nothing, and suddenly there was everything. Nothing produced something. There was this big bang without cause, and there is everything that we can see. And I think we can see the pride and the deception of the human heart. Where to acknowledge and have to acknowledge the glory of God means we have to live our lives before the true awesomeness of God to whom we must give moral account. Atheists. Richard Dawkins, um, quite famous, stroke infamous, he warns his trainee biologists at university against the, he says, the appearance of an intelligent designer simply because the obvious thing is that creation does in fact speak of a creator. In his book, The Blind Watchmaker, he says, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. I once gave a talk on what would Jesus say to Richard Dawkins and invited the uh, chairperson of the local skeptic society in Horsham, which led to some interesting discussion and I got invited to one of their meetings when there was a speaker on, who spoke on being good without God. When I suggested that they had a, a great faith, some of them were really quite outraged by that suggestion. So the creation speaks clearly of God's awesome majesty and otherness. He is set apart from all that he has made. That is part of his holiness. And this revelation of God's holiness is universal in its impact. I haven't got time for, to read Romans 1, 18 to 20, but you might want to look at that later on where it speaks about this. God's holiness is there for all to see, yet the lie is there is no holy creator. And that lie has been sold to generations of school kids. Commentators then wonder why there's an abandonment of any sense of right and wrong, or of a God who provides an unchanging moral compass. And as a result, a nation does what they think it's right to do in its own eyes. You keep telling children that they are animals 
created by chance and there is no absolute right or wrong. We shouldn't be surprised if that is how they act and grow up to be adults who act like that. So let me conclude. As we contemplate what the Holy One of Israel has revealed to us, we need to consider whether we have created an image of God that suits us and our view of what we think God should be like or should do or not do. We need to recognize that we cannot create God in our own image. We can't say things like, well, God wouldn't do that. Or the God of the Old Testament is not the one I kind of like because of some of the things that he did. Instead, we must recognize that God's holiness is absolute. And as God's people, we are the ones who need to change. Our call to be holy as he is holy is because we are God's people and joined to him. We represent him. We are his body and his children. And to pursue holiness is to pursue God. And to pursue holiness is to pursue Christ-likeness. If we are to ask God to reveal his holiness to us, as God revealed it to Isaiah, we are opening our lives to radical change. We can't remain the same. We will be shaken, I believe, to the core. But as Christians, that is what we are called to do. I believe as we, in God's grace, he reveals his holiness to us, it will change what we look at. It will change what we say to and about others. It will change our relationships. It will change our marriages. It will change what we do with our money. It will change how we spend our time. When we pray in a moment, as we do on a Sunday, come, Holy Spirit, we are asking for his holiness to be revealed to us. For us to see God just for who he is. If we want to pursue that, God will expose our own sin, our own uncleanness, which will lead to repentance. And he's made a way for us to be right, to be cleansed. More than anything, it will be recognition for our need of the cross, where God's judgment and mercy meet. Where his holiness And his love was made complete. So why don't you stand with me this morning, if you want to, and you can. And let's pray.